Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, it's great to be here with you. This is the very famous Understanding Energy class. Uh, lots of my students take it, and most of them tell me it's like one of the best classes they've ever had at Stanford. So uh, anyway, hopefully I can contribute to, to that a little bit. So I'm a professor in the Energy Science and Engineering Department. And I guess my entire career, I've been working on some aspect related to energy. I started out in geothermal energy and, um, and then did a bunch of stuff. We actually worked in groundwater pollution. And, uh, and eventually, I made my way to begin to work on carbon capture and storage, in particular, the underground storage of carbon dioxide. And as a part of that journey, I became really fascinated with the energy transition much more broadly. So that's really what I do, is I think about you know, how do we create a global decarbonized energy system that provides reliable access to energy for everyone, everyone on the planet. Um, just a little bit more about my background. I, when I was a teenager, I had an amazing privilege to live for two years in Pakistan. I lived in three cities. I lived in Peshawar, I, not in Peshawar, Rawalpindi, uh, Islamabad, and then uh, Lahore. And uh, that was a long time ago. That was in the 19, uh, late 1960s. And so I go back there now every year. I've been doing that for about a decade. And that's a picture I took in 2015. Um, and you know what you see is you see a, a, a farmer or part of a farmer's family uh, bringing their produce to market. Uh, and their mode of transportation is a cart uh, pulled by a donkey. Now, you might be wondering, is this unusual? Uh, did I happen to find the, the one last donkey you know, in, in Pakistan you know, taking produce to the market? And the answer is absolutely not. If you go to the rural parts of many places in this world, uh, South Asia um, and, uh, and, and Africa, the idea of using animals for transportation is actually still very common. So you might be thinking, well, that looks okay, right? It's a, you know, maybe the maybe he doesn't have the farmer doesn't have to go far, but but this then speaks to one of the fundamental challenges with if you don't have access to modern transportation, that farmer who's growing those the carrots and and uh, other greens in his in his field um, has very little choice of where he can take his produce to. The farthest he can go is to the local market. And when you only can take your produce to the local market, well, what does that mean? It means everybody else who's growing carrots, you know, carrot, like if you're a farmer, you know that everything kind of has a season and they like to ripen at one time. All of a sudden, the market is sort of flooded with one particular crop, which means that the price of that goes way down. So you've worked hard and, and you're unable to sell it for a very high price. Or if there's so much available in this local market that you end up uh, creating a lot of food waste because simply there, there's no market for that and there's no way to take that out to, uh, to a different market in the country. And, and at the same time, there's food poverty um, that's also very important, but because, again, lack of access to modern transportation, it creates a cascade of problems. So often when we think about uh, energy access, you know, we think about electricity, we think about clean cooking fuels, but it's also very important to remember that transportation is also a critical service that needs to be provided. So today I'm going to be giving you lots of facts and figures about the status of global energy access. And as we go along, I, I hope to tell you more of these stories that will help illuminate these issues and make you feel compassionate and compelled to try to figure out a way that we can make sure that people get access to energy because people are really suffering from the lack of access to modern energy services. So, so with that background, you know, I, I said I spend almost all my time thinking about sustainable energy for all. 
And, and the question is, is, well, what do you mean by sustainable energy for everyone? Well, fortunately, there's a lot more thought that has been put into this over the last, um, over the last decade or so, particularly in light of the sustainable development goals, which are begin to lay out which are beginning to lay out a very clear framework and targets for uh, what we mean by this. But when I think about this, I think about, you know, we want energy to be accessible to people so that it, and, and what does that mean? Well, it's reliable when you go to plug, you know, your, your uh, electric cord into the wall, you actually get electricity out. Um, that you get the kind of energy that's useful to you. You know, if you're getting something that, you know, can light a light bulb and what you really need to do is you need to run an autoclave to sterilize hospital equipment, you know, it's, that, that it's not going to be very useful to you. And of course, we want it to be equitably distributed amongst people. So that's sort of the very sort of bottom tier of what we think about as a sustainable energy system. But it's also important that it's affordable. Because there are many places in the world where there's access to energy, but it's simply too expensive for people to use it at all or use enough of it so that they can uh, be comfortable. And again, when we think about affordability, it's also predictability of prices. If you have huge volatility, like we're beginning to see or what we've seen um, historically also in the energy system, uh, that is a challenge. Um, it also needs to be competitive uh, with other forms of energy. That could be competitive across countries or competitive within, uh, within the country that you're considering. Uh, resistant, uh, resilient, but also profitable. You know, at the, at the end of the day, energy requires massive investment, largely by private sector actors. And unless the energy system is profitable enough, those investors will take those same resources in and put them someplace else because they are not, um, you know, most private sector investors, you know, have a lot of latitude about where they're investing their resources. So moving on, it's also important to think about national security uh, and also that the energy system is protective of the environment. So that's air quality, that's climate water resources and ecosystems. And I think that there are many discussions that take place day in and day out uh, on, on uh, this campus and campuses around the world that are focusing on the environmental aspects. There are also lots of conversations about affordability that take place in other contexts and security and so forth. But the accessibility one is one that needs more attention and, um, and that's what I'll be discussing. So before we talk more about energy, though, I want to talk about something called the Human Development Index, basically an index that was to develop to try to categorize sort of the, the level of, of well-being um, or economic adequacy um, as reflected through a number of particular indicators. And in particular, the indicators that are used for the Human Development Index are uh, one related to a long and healthy life, so looking at life expectancy at birth. The second one has to do with knowledge, and there are two components to that. The first one is sort of expected years of schooling. You know, so governments set up educational programs, and you know, in, in the United States, you know, we have what K through 12. Well, different countries have different expectations for what kind of uh, education would be provided. So that's part of the index. The second part is what is the actual uh, amount of schooling that people get? How many years of schooling? So there's your aspirations or the system you've set up and then there's the actual outcomes. Um, and then the final one is the uh, decent standard of living, uh, which is reflected in the, the GNI or basically the amount of money per capita um, the, across the country. And these three things are wrapped together in terms of this human development index. So, uh, so here's a chart. Um, the fantastic thing today is there is so much data. Um, I spent uh, the last little while sort of trying to get very up to date. Uh, I was in Washington, as you heard. I didn't work on these issues in Washington, so spent time getting up to date. And, and I would say that there's at least an order of magnitude or more of data available publicly, which is fantastic uh, through many uh, different organizations. 
Uh, this one is available through the United Nations. And what it shows is these are all different countries, and we're not going to go through them all, but, but you can see that there are three big clusters. There's the one on the top, uh, and these are ones with basically relatively high human development indicators. There's the green, which is sort of medium, uh, and then red down at the bottom. So I think that the, the good news is that, uh, by and large, these seem to be going up across many countries, uh, particularly in, in the, the lower half of this graph. But the bad news is, is that they're still very far from where we would like to see them, right? You know, we'd like to see human development indexes you know, over, over, um, you know, over 80% 80, 80 or so. So well, why do I show this? Well, uh, that brings up this graph. What we show here is the human development index as a function of the energy per capita. And what you can see is that the countries with very low uh, human development indices tend to have very, very low uh, per capita energy use. And as you go up, you get to higher levels. And at some point, this kind of levels off. So it's like, well, more energy does not make people live longer or get better educated or have higher gross national incomes. That purple dot in the middle up on the top there, that's the United States, okay? So very high um, energy use per capita, also very high human development index. Um, if we were to look down, uh, oh gosh, at around um, like 80 uh, gigajoules per person uh, versus, and it would be a human development index, I think of around 0.75, that would be China. Uh, if we moved over to the left at around 25 gigajoules per capita uh, and a human development index of about, I think, point, uh, point 0.65 maybe or point 0.6, uh, that would be India. Okay. Anyway, there's also fantastic, you can look at this, how this has changed through time. But the bottom line here is that for those people lacking access to energy, they have extremely low human development indices. So let's um, take a look at a little bit more detail uh, about the relationship between energy access and human development. So on the top here, we have the energy com consumption in gigajoules per person per year. And that's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, okay? And so what we find is that for people with very, very low access, less than, less than 20 gigajoules per person, uh, that people are basically using biomass to meet their fundamental needs for cooking, warmth, uh, getting access to water, maybe household lighting, um, and very, very basic communications like cell phones. So as people are able to move up in terms of energy access, we start people, seeing people use it for productivity enhancing uh, subsistence activities. So we begin to see use of um, energy for irrigation. That could be like solar pumps or it could be grid connected pumps. Uh, we also begin to see food preservation, things like drying or, or uh, cooking uh, as a way of food production. And then we begin to see more access for uh, transportation to getting produce to markets. As we move up that spectrum uh, in the, around the 60 gigajoules per person, uh, what we find is people begin to use energy to really enhance the quality of their life. So enhance communications, entertainment, school lighting, computer access, basic health care, you know, widespread transport, modern education, and, and sanitation. Moving up the spectrum a little bit more, we begin to see more industrial activities uh, where people can use automated machinery, um, uh, there's large-scale industrial processing, natural resource recovery uh, for, for mining activities, uh, for example, and we begin to see access to high-speed transport, uh, and then moving up, if you're above about 100, uh, people begin to uh, further advance quality of life. Uh, so comfort, heating and cooling, advanced health care, forefront technological development, advanced manufacturing and recreational travel. So 
so I think this also might help explain why it is that once you get sort of past 100 gigajoules per person, um, these activities are certainly making people's lives more pleasant, but it's not clear that, that they're going to enhance education or, or necessarily include, uh, increase the income of the country. So these are, many of these would be more like service economy or advanced economic development activities. So, so as we see people increase energy access, they move up through the spectrum. And very importantly, the ability to move up the spectrum, particularly to get to industrial activities, also depends on, on the energy availability, meaning that it's uh, available on demand. If you have a factory, like if you have a factory and you lose your electricity, uh, it might only be off for a couple of minutes, but to restart that factory could take hours or, or even days. So it's very, very disruptive, and it gets to be very difficult to, um, to basically make money uh, with a very unreliable electricity. So there's the availability moving from sporadic to on demand. And similarly, in terms of energy quality, uh, that, uh, that you know, from very poor, uh, to excellent, and so what do we mean by excellent? So things like frequency control and voltage control for your power systems, so that, uh, again, that you have the ability to run um, advanced manufacturing processes, which rely on very high quality power. So this is the journey that, uh, that people need to take if they're going to be able to improve their lives through better energy access. So, so I mentioned before that, uh, that if we look at this graph, we can see to the left, typically the, the human development index is, is, uh, is far below those countries who are at the top. But again, once you move to the right of that, there is no uh, clear benefit in terms of improving human development index. You have to do other things, not just provide energy if you want to do that. So. We can ask a very simple question, uh, and, and I think these are very empowering questions. It's uh, how much energy would we need to get everybody up to 100 gigajoules per person? And so we have about 8.1 billion people on the planet. Uh, so that would get us to 810 exajoules of, uh, of energy. So right now we're using about 673 exajoules uh, in 2022. Uh, which is only about 1.2 times today's energy use. So I think that's actually really extraordinary to think that, you know, if we were to equitably distribute, you know, this 100 gigajoules per person around the world, we would only need 20% more energy for everybody to have enough today. So it didn't used to be that way. When I first started working with all these numbers, we were at... Uh, at about 500 um, exajoules uh, total energy use. And, and, but still the need was, you know, as you forecast out into the future in particular, the need was greater. So I used to always have this number in my head, oh, we need double the amount of energy to kind of get equitable access to anybody. But because, um, because of the improvements in energy access, we really don't need so much as, uh, as we used to. So 20% more. So I've, I was really encouraged uh, when, uh, when I saw that number. Now, of course, there are tons of countries like the United States who use way, way more than that. And we have a huge opportunity to be much more efficient uh, in the United States. But there are other countries like the UK and Germany who are much, much closer to that 100 gigajoules per capita and still have very thriving uh, advanced economies that, um, that support their public, uh, population. So, uh, so that's some sort of energy basics. Uh, what I'd like to do now is move on to the sustainable development goals. Uh, so, so this is another um, activity. When, uh, when this first uh, was developed, I thought it was fantastic and aspirational, but I didn't really know how it was going to be used. But I will say I'm just incredibly impressed how this has now created an international framework around which uh, major organizations related to energy, health, 
finance are all coalescing to gather data and set targets for all of the goals uh, that, are, that are outlined. And, and again, fantastically rich set of resources uh, available on this. But the reason I wanted to stop here for a moment is of course that one of the goals um, is for affordable and clean energy access for everyone. But I think hopefully through my discussion over the last little while, it's also clear it's going to be very difficult to solve many of these other goals unless we also, uh, or even first, uh, solve the clean energy access goal. So it's very difficult to raise people from poverty, um, basically without industrial development. It, it's extremely difficult to raise people from poverty. Industrial development requires energy. Um, the agricultural system is also very dependent on energy access, and we'll talk about that more, and, uh, and the kinds of energy that's needed and why it's so important. Obviously, uh, good health uh, and well-being. This can be looked at a number of ways. You know, energy use today is a major polluter, uh, particularly in developing economies, so we've got to clean up the energy system if we're going to reduce air pollution. Uh, and uh, exposure to that. But also a modern healthcare system also requires uh, high quality energy. Uh, quality education. Uh, again, unless you can have uh, societies that, uh, that are well off enough to support children to, to spend the time they need in the, energy, uh, in the educational system, it's going to be difficult. Um, gender equity. Uh, there are many examples where disproportionate use of people's time, uh, in particular women and children uh, collecting biomass would be a really good example. Uh, just huge amounts of effort required uh, that uh, create um, a gender equity issue. Clean water and sanitation, modern, modern water treatment systems require energy. Uh, decent work and economic growth, I've already talked about that. Again, industrial development, innovation and infrastructure all require modern energy. Uh, reducing inequalities, that uh, you know, if, if, you're that, uh, if you're that farmer who only has a donkey cart to get your produce to the market, it's going to be very difficult for you to compete with an industrial scale uh, farming operation. And of course, climate action uh, re requires us to fundamentally rethink and change the energy system as we know it. So, uh, so you know, this, if we went back five years, we would be thinking about this. But again, what has encouraged me so much is all of these goals have now been translated things into things that are very, very concrete. So these are the particular goals that are being focused on um, by the, um, all of the organizations working on sustainable development uh, goals. The first is to ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services. Uh, the second one is increase substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. Uh, the third one is, is to double the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. So historically, we increased um, the sort of energy productivity of the economy at about 1% uh, a year. Uh, so now calling for, for doubling of that, or actually we're getting a little behind, so even thinking about tripling that. Uh, the fourth goal has to do with enhancing international cooperation to facilitate access to clean energy research and technology including renewable energy, energy efficiency, and so forth. So making sure that developing economies have the, have the, the help they need and in international cooperation to help them succeed. And the final one specifically has to do with expanding infrastructure and upgrading technology so that everyone has access to that very high quality energy that I mentioned. And in particular, that you know, just having nighttime lighting and a television and a cell phone charger, you know, is not going to be sufficient. So we really need to be planning for the infrastructure upgrades that will provide access to everyone. 
So those are the goals. And, uh, and again, they've been translated to very specific and measurable, um, measurable uh, quantities. Again, I, I think this is just so encouraging. And the really good news is that there's a lot of progress. So it's sort of the good news and the bad news. The good news is that there's been a huge amount of progress. The bad news is, is that it's not fast enough and that we have to work harder if we want to meet the 2030 goal of achieving all of these sustainable development goals that have been outlined. Uh, but let's go through these. So again, here, here is this report that, that outlines all of this information. So the first one has to do with the population uh, who uh, has access or to uh, electricity. And so if we go back to 20, 2010, there were about 1.1 billion people who did not have access to electricity um, in the, the last year. So this is 2022 data. Um, there are only 675 million people lacking access to electricity. Now, I say only 675. That's good compared to 1.1 billion. Uh, but to put it in perspective, it's like double the population of the United States. Uh, the second one, and, and extremely challenging, is providing access to clean cooking fuels. So back in 2010, uh, 2.9 billion people basically used biomass, sort of unprocessed raw biomass, so straw, wood, cow dung, um, for, uh, for provide, charcoal uh, for providing uh, cooking fuels. So 2.9 billion. The good news is that's dropped some down to about 2.3 billion, but not going nearly fast enough. And this is one of the most intractable challenges we face. And I'll, I'll talk quite a bit more about that. So the next one has to do with renewable energy shares um, in the total final energy consumption. So uh, about 16% in 2010. Uh, 19.1% uh, 19 in, um, in uh, 2022. Uh, again, better, but not fast enough. And the next one is uh, the energy intensity, so basically an energy efficiency measure uh, that was uh, 5.53 uh, megajoules per US dollar. Uh, that's improved to 4.63 megajoules per dollar. Uh, again, getting better, but not fast enough. And then finally, looking at the last one, which is perhaps the most concerning, and, and really this le latest report has shown a spotlight on this. If you look at the international flows of funding into supporting clean energy development in these developing economies, uh, it was about $11.9 billion in 2010, and it's actually less now. And it reached its peak in 2017 uh, flattened out, the pandemic came along, it went down, and it still hasn't recovered. So this is really an urgent and critical issue um, that needs to be addressed. And, and you know, over in, um, at the Conference of the Parties at COP, uh, there's a huge amount of discussion about this particular issue, is how do we increase the money flows uh, into this? That's sort of the big picture. Uh, every, uh, every country uh, now, uh, there's data collection. Um, and so we can see this. So this is an overall score for the sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, and, and the bottom line is sort of, well, nobody's really on track. Maybe Brazil, Scandinavia. Uh, Brazil has a lot of biomass and hydro. Um, uh, Scandinavia has a lot of, uh, a lot of hydro um, and also uh, been really pushed on electrification of, of things like vehicles. Um, and the rest of the world we see is, you know, much of it is like orange, like the United States. This is largely to do with renewable energy shares are not going up uh, as much as, as we would like. Uh, <clears throat> similarly in China, Australia, uh, India. Um, but you also see parts of the world that are red, uh, Africa in particular. And this has to do with not enough progress on, on energy access. So, uh, so what I'd like to do now is shift to this particular point.
portion of the curve here. Okay, so, uh, so these are the people with the lowest human development index or countries with people who have the lowest human development index who tend to have less than 25 gigajoules per person. So India today would be right at this cusp. And I don't know, how many of you have been to India? I'm sure some of you were, yeah? Yeah, not, not enough. You should all go to India. India is an awesome place. Uh, and if you go to the major cities in India, you know, they're as modern as, as any modern country you can go to. Um, but if you go into the rural areas and places like India have a very large rural population, um, there is still a huge amount of work to do to, to raise up uh, uh, energy access. And that's why this 25 gigajoules per person uh, in India today is uh, as low as it is. So that's what we're going to focus on, and really, you know, what can we do about it? Because that's really what we care about. Um, so, uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, you can see a graph of people without access to electricity. So uh, again, back in about 2012, um, about 1.3 uh, billion people lacking access, uh, dropped really steadily. There was a very big focus on this. Uh, we begin to see this leveling off. Uh, this was in part due to the pandemic, uh, as well as some of the structural issues I talked about with lack of, uh, lack of investment capital. But uh, one of the very disturbing things that we're beginning to see is this is starting to go back up. So there are places where the population is actually growing faster than the rate of increasing energy access. And in particular, this is what we're seeing in, uh, in large parts of Africa. So again, this is very concerning. Um, and yeah. So, uh, so the second uh, issue that uh, is really key uh, is the uh, people without access to clean cooking fuels. So we see uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, nearly, uh, nearly a billion uh, people there. Uh, developing Asia, uh, over, um, over you know, 1.3 billion people there. And, uh, and then a small amount uh, in the rest of the world. So again, about a third of the people today still use burning solid fuels, typically indoor, uh, inside that um, you know create terrible air pollution problems for uh, particularly women and children who are exposed to them. So we can dig into this uh, a little bit more, and um, this is taken from the IEA Energy Access Outlook, and this was the last time they did this report. But I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic to take a, a look at this because it's quite a good report because it's not just data. There's actually a lot of analysis. There's a lot of um, uh, planning and strategy around how we're going to solve these problems. So you got to encourage you to look at this. But uh, what the point of this graph here is that what we're looking at is the where people are getting, where people are sourcing their energy from uh, as a function of the income, whether they're lower income, lower middle, uh, upper middle, or high income. And so green is biomass, uh, blue is electricity, uh, the gray is other, so basically uh, liquid or gaseous fuels. Uh, the, other, the other thing you can see here is energy use per capita. Okay, again, so all of these countries here, very low energy use per capita, uh, going up as you move over to these higher income countries. So the first thing that, uh, that you notice is that um, for, for low income countries, basically biomass is the primary uh, fuel that, that people are using. Uh, as, you, as you move up in income, we get, begin to see a larger fraction of, of transportation fuels uh, still relatively small amount of electricity, ex except for the most developed. Uh, and then as you go over to um, upper middle and middle, um, what we see is about 20% of final energy, end use energy comes from electricity. Uh, and uh, the rest uh, largely from other types of fuels um, 
again, gaseous or, or liquid fuels. And this is strongly related to economic development. So before we talk any more, just I'd like to define what energy access means. So, so basically, it's a household having reliable and affordable access to both clean cooking facilities and electricity, which is enough to provide a basic bundle of energy services initially, and then increasing level of electricity over time to reach the regional average. Okay, so it's kind of a complicated definition, and it's not a static definition, but says we'll provide the basics and then uh, improve it to the average level. And this basic bundle of energy services means, at a minimum, several light bulbs, task lighting, such as a flashlight, phone charging, and a radio. So, so you can see this is really a very minimal, uh, minimal requirement. And then in terms of access to clean cooking facilities, it's uh, modern, it means access to uh, and primary use of modern fuels and technologies, including natural gas, liquid petroleum gas, electricity and biogas, or improved biomass cook stoves as, to base, as opposed to the basic biomass cook stoves and three stone fires used in developing countries. Um, so if anybody's interested, there was a huge push to try to make better wood-burning stoves uh, for people to use indoors. Um, it certainly made some improvement, but I think as time has gone on and it was recognized that you know, it's sort of like being like somebody who smokes four packs of cigarettes a day and you only go down and smoke two packs, right? You're still pretty sick. You know, burning things indoors is just super unhealthy. So the idea of, you know, these sort of improved indoor cook stoves uh, is getting less traction. And really the focus um, is either providing natural gas, liquid petroleum gas, electricity, or um, in very limited instances, biogas. And there have been a lot of hopes for biogas. We've done some work on that, but it's very tricky to get a, bio, a biogas uh, system uh, up and running uh, over, over, the long time period, over a long time period. So, so you might be thinking, oh my gosh, this sounds like it's kind of directly in, in conflict with our climate goals of you know, stopping to use fossil fuel-based resources. And, and I think that this is a very real and, and, and uh, you know, direct conflict that people are coming to grips with um, because uh, you know, it's important for people's health, well-being, uh, but at the same time, it's a climate problem. What we've seen in terms of on the ground action is there's been a big priority to try to, to improve access to LPG and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and natural gas, particularly LPG in, in rural areas. Basically prioritizing the health and well, immediate health and well-being over uh, these longer term issues. So let's, uh, so let's take a look at uh, uh, electricity access. Again, this is 2022 data. And um, uh, again, we're down to what, 675 million people. Uh, most of those are, are concentrated in, uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, though uh, certainly parts of uh, South Asia uh, also have access issues and so forth. Now, one thing that is a question was, so there's been a lot of discussion in practice, what does electricity access mean? Does it mean that you have a, a power line that, that brings power into a village, and so that the village has access, and that if the individual has the finances and capacity to hook up to it, they can? Uh, or does it mean that you have every house connected? Well, in practice, uh, it's meant that uh, you bring power to a village and it's sort of left up then to the individuals or the communities themselves to, to do that last final hookup. So, so even in the many places where it looks like we have extremely high electricity access, either for financial reasons or because the household itself couldn't hook up to the grid, um, that the picture is not quite as rosy as I think is often portrayed. 
So that's that. Um, okay, so why, um, why is it that there's, this is such a problem? Well, there are two basic reasons. One is, one is economic, uh, meaning people simply can't afford it. And uh, here's a number of countries, uh, and, uh, and you can see all of these bars in yellow here. Uh, these, uh, these are indication that this is the fraction of the population who simply can't afford electricity, even if it's available in, in their village. Um, but then there's this second group, and again, it's very large. There are also many people who are above the poverty line who, in principle, could afford at least a minimum amount of electricity, but simply there's no grid uh, available for them to access. So it's both, both reasons. And if we look at where people are distributed, uh, in urban environments, uh, we're at uh, something on the order of uh, oh, about 100 million people uh, without access to electricity, um, and largely, again, in sub-Saharan Africa. But the larger number of people are really people in rural areas where it's much more challenging to extend the electric grid uh, out to these communities because it's... Uh, quite expensive and requires large-scale infrastructure projects. Um, and again, you can see largely concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, also there are still uh, communities in um, Central and South Asia uh, lacking this. But largely, um, this is a, a rural issue. OK, so as we've talked about, there's been a lot of progress, 1.1 uh, billion people down to about 675 million people lacking access to electricity. Well, how was this done? Um, basically, uh, this uh, kind of illustrates this, that 97% um, of the electricity access um, since 2000 has been in grid-connected services, meaning you know the power grid was extended, communities hooked up and so forth. So these were not off-grid uh, solutions. Those have been uh, emergent uh, more recently than this. Uh, the other thing we can look at, where is this electricity coming from? Uh, the brown is the coal, so we can focus. Let's look at this one. Brown is the coal. So you can see maybe 40% of the new electricity is from coal. Uh, maybe, I don't know, 20% or less is from gas very little from oil, which is typical, uh, quite a bit from hydro, uh, uh, some from geothermal, some from solar PV. Um, and then this last little bit is in terms of decentralized renewables. So that's where it's coming from. Of course, this is uh, you know, problematic in that uh, you know, this reflects a lot of coal-fired power generation a lot of emissions of carbon dioxide, but also a lot of emissions of particulate pollutions, uh, particulate pollution, and uh, depending upon the uh, emission standards, um, they, they may or may not have the kind of controls that we would require, for example, here in the United States. So both an air pollutant and, um, and, uh, and a climate uh, pollutant. Um, but again, it reflects you know, the very real tension between the imperative to provide people to access to electricity uh, at the same time recognizing that we need to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And again, herein lies the tension <clears throat> that um, the world finds itself in today. Over the last decade, you know, we all know that the price of, price of photovoltaics has plummeted. And I'm sure you are experts on this by now. And so it's uh, important to think about, well, what role can solar play in alleviating the uh, energy access uh, deficit around the world? And uh, this is a, a little image that illustrates the different types of solar from very, very small scale systems, you know, pico uh, solar systems, where it's basically a light bulb or two and a tiny little panel. Uh, there are off-grid systems that uh, might get you that whole bundle of services and maybe a television. There are mini grids that can serve uh, communities. Um, and then finally, there's grid-connected um, electricity, including utility-scale solar. 
So if we say, OK, well, what are these different things going to be useful for? So if you look at things like uh, Pico, Pico Solar, uh, and so forth, um, you know, this could be useful for our household and community uses. Uh, as we go to larger systems, you know, off-grid systems and mini-grids, uh, we can start thinking about things like refrigeration, incredibly important for food preservation uh, and medicines and so forth. Maybe you can get a, a fan to help with space conditioning and TV. Uh, if, on the other hand, we want to start having uh, larger appliances, uh, we need to really think about then mini-grid systems. And the reason is, is that the power requirement is, is going to be higher. You know, you need a, a kilowatt or a couple of kilowatts. So how, much, uh, how many kilowatts is your hair dryer? Uh, yeah, it's like 1,000 thousand watts or, or two, yeah, or two, yeah, two kilowatts. So, um, and if you think about that, that is not like a really huge device, right? You couldn't cook with that. That wouldn't be enough to cook with. So, you know, as you get to wanting to use large scale appliances, run motors and so forth, the power requirements are very, very high. So you really need to think about larger systems. And in particular, that's where grid connected systems become more useful. Uh, so those are household and community uses. And, and again, thinking about how do we really so use energy to support economic development. Uh, we're interested in the productive uses. So things like irrigation. Um, there are mini grid systems and grid, and, uh, and grid connected systems for irrigation, uh, small industry, and so forth. So, so the point here being that you know, if you have these small off-grid solar systems, yes, they can make people's lives better in terms of <clears throat> better communications, lighting, you know, basic safety, and so forth. Um, but uh, they are not going to support the kind of economic development of activity that will allow them to rise out of poverty. So uh, again, going back to this 2017 report um, that, uh, that uh, laid out basically a strategy for meeting the sustainable development goals for energy and, uh, and through economic analysis and, and so forth, uh, they uh, concluded that about 50% of the energy access that was needed could be provided by grid connected solutions but the remaining 50% that uh, it, it would be more practical and faster to, uh, to use either mini-grid systems or off-grid systems, uh, particularly in the rural areas. So that's basically what this said. And uh, in terms of the you know, fuel sources for the grid-connected sources, their best estimate was is about 50% would come from fossil fuels with, um, with uh, a mix of renewables, um, but that the mini-grid and off-grid systems would be more renewable dominated. So that's uh, how we could get there. So the question is, well, how are we, how are we doing? Let's go back and look at some of these numbers. Uh, so if we look at mini-grid systems, we, you know, we sort of on the track to um, being able to provide access to 150 million people. Well. This is some data, uh, again, showing how we're doing with these mini, mini grid systems. And this is 2010 up to uh, 2021. And uh, what you can see is we're only at about 10 million people. So we are very, very far behind being on track to get up to 150 million people. Uh, being uh, being uh, provided access through these kind of, of uh, systems. And similarly, if we look at standalone systems, uh, here's data from, uh, from 2016 up to 2021 that uh, you can see that we kind of stalled out. Again, a lot of this is associated with the pandemic and supply chain problems and, and simply you know, people weren't uh, getting out to, to purchase these things. Um, and then one more thing, just uh, so tier one and tier two, 
basically these are, are you know, very simple systems, basically uh, would provide that sort of basic bundle of services. And this tier two would correspond to uh, a larger system that could get you the kind of power that you would need, for example, to run um, uh, smaller appliances. So again, we've really got a lot of work to do. And you can see this is up at about 70 million. And again, we would like to be closer to, uh, to uh, 150 there. So again, lots of work to do. So as people have grappled with this, uh, an idea emerged um, uh, about uh, five years ago that it was sort of too much to ask uh, communities to in too much challenge for the financial um, financers of these projects to go into a community that did not have um, sort of an anchor tenant for the um, for the energy um, that they would be providing. So the, this idea came along as like let's use industry as an anchor tenant. So, and then if you, if you can have this anchor tenant, you can build a big system, uh, you can increase it over time so the community doesn't sort of have to bear that first upfront cost. So uh, the kind of uh, anchor tenants would be, for example, a cell tower. You know, these are run by large industrial conglomerates and they can certainly uh, affordably, you know, pay for their electricity bill and they're going to pay it every month. Textile factories, uh, paper mills and so forth. So, uh, so this is one of the major strategies that's now being pursued. So we're not going to go into this in detail because I want to move on. But the bottom line is that uh, it was estimated that we need about $725 billion to get universal energy access. So the problem is this, it's not like this was requiring massive capital infusion. It's a matter of making the decision and coming up with the financial models that allow people to make these investments that, uh, that they will get the returns they need in order to justify those investments. So it's sort of a systemic financial problem. It's not that, oh, it's simply too expensive, because it's really not expensive at all. This is really within reach. And uh, you know, we're talking about something like $60 billion a year uh, to, to achieve this. This is not a lot of money. If you look at how much you know, we're spending you know, every day, there's a, you know, a new $100 billion announcement of how much we're spending to do one thing or another around the world. So, Anyway, I, I, uh, I, I hope that uh, we can find a way to manage the finance for this because a lot of people's lives will be improved dramatically. I'm going to talk about clean cooking fuels. So 2.3 billion people. Okay, so why is it so bad we don't have clean cooking fuels? You know, we all like to barbecue. You know, it's like fun. You know, why not barbecue every day? Um, so first of all, is that uh, you, know, you need to get the fuel. So here, here's a picture. This is a woman carrying uh, wood, you know, these you know, big branches and twigs and so forth. Um, you know, very, very difficult physical labor. Uh, this is another kind of biomass energy. So these are basically cow patties that are made that you add. You take cow poop and you add straw to it, and then you throw it on a wall and you allow it to dry. And um, you know, the, so here's a little gold mine of energy here. Um, but again, it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of time and effort. And this is an estimate of the amount of time that, uh, that people are spending, you know, five hours a day, you know, all the way down to you know, as, uh, many countries with an hour a day. Uh, and again, this is largely work of women uh, and, and children. And in these countries, you know, the majority of, uh, of cooking fuels are from these sources. So another one has to do with, uh, with uh, premature deaths associated with exposure to, uh, to indoor air pollution. But actually, when you go talk with the villagers, you know, they'll tell you there are many other problems, just their eyes, you know, how much it's hurt their eyes. You know, it was just devastating to have to be indoors. So here's like a, a chula 
Uh, this is a particular kind of indoor stove. Here was a woman who was, um, you know, who, who cooked this way. And it's also not a very efficient way of cooking. It takes, you know, four, typically like four hours of cooking a day with the smoke, uh, again, inside uh, with women and children being exposed to it. So it's estimated that 240 thousand uh, children die annually from indoor air pollution associated with these and uh, up to about five million uh, people a year dying from this. And in the longer term, it's not just about pollution and, and the huge amount of time, but uh, the, the uh, sustainability of woody biomass is also a, cha a challenge that uh, if you look at the reduction in the availability, that there are many countries that are slowly uh, depleting uh, their sources of biomass. So, so uh, at some point, this too will become a crisis. And the more depletion you have, the farther people have to walk and so forth to, uh, to go get their fuels. So as I mentioned in the beginning, this has been one of the most intractable problems. With electricity, we saw real progress but uh, progress has been much slower. So, uh, so here, so this is the, the percentage of the global population with access to clean cooking fuels. So going from around 70%, 75% in 2000, uh, and we're now up at what, I don't know, maybe you know 85% or so. Uh, and then these are, this is in the urban areas and rural areas. So you see that the many people who live in rural areas still um, are very far from, uh, from uh, getting access to clean cooking fuels. So, so what are the solutions? Um, so uh, so uh, these are the, the, the different solutions. So biomass this is traditional, coal, kerosene, biomass. If anyone's ever been around burning kerosene, you know how absolutely polluting that is. It's just terrible. Uh, so in addition to um, emitting carbon dioxide and particulate pollution. One of them is this black carbon, which is also an important greenhouse gas. Um, here's advanced biomass, liquid petroleum gas, electricity, biogas, solar cookers, and so forth. And there are um, parameters that influence this, so stove cost, fuel cost, reliability, health impacts, gender inequality, environmental impacts, and fuel availability. So I just want to focus on two. Um, so LPG, um, the stoves cost a lot more money than you know building a building a building a wood stove. Uh, fuel cost is moderately high, uh, reliability moderate, uh, very big health impacts, gender equity, environmental impact, um, and fuel fuel availability is is mixed. Um, so. The places where LPG is taking off, uh, many governments have subsidized this. There are places where it's almost nearly entirely subsidized by the government, uh, particularly some South American uh, countries, but actually in, in many places. But because of the health benefits, this is, as you'll see shortly, the dominant mode for addressing this issue. The second one, you might say, well, why not use electricity? Um, because um, you know, that's super clean, you know, at least a point of use. The challenge with electricity is you, it re requires a lot of power. I gave the example of the hairdryer. Okay, so stoves require many, many kilowatts of power uh, in order to, to cook with like an electric resistance heater. Maybe you could move to an induction stove, but then those are very expensive. So, uh, so there are real um, uh, affordability issues. Um, and, uh, and, and, and power issues associated with this. So we can look at what's actually happening on the ground. So, uh, so this is in urban areas and rural areas. You can see an increase again in gas. So this could be natural gas or LPG. Uh, we are seeing also an increase uh, in electricity in, uh, in uh, urban areas. Uh, in the rural areas, again, we're behind, but we do see you know, some decrease in the biomass, uh, increasing LPG, and, uh, and somewhat slower increases in electricity. Again, this is largely because this has a, a lot of requirements on the grid. 
So that's how this is being addressed. And uh, in the last few minutes, I just want to go back to um, energy access for productive uses. So if we go back and we look at those countries that were on the far left left hand side of the human development index graph, they would be represented by these uh, low income countries. And what we see is that uh, the majority of energy use is actually for residential energy use. So basically cooking and, and so forth and heating. But if you want to make this jump to the lower uh, middle income or, or middle income, what the differentiator is that there's a huge increase in um, the industry, the, uh, the energy for productive uses. So you have to have this high quality energy. So I think for energy access, that is really the challenge. So we either have to build strong, capable grids to get the power to people, and ideally those are clean grids, um, or we have to think about hydrogen, or we have to think about biogas, something that uh, will, will provide reliable, high power energy for these uses. And also we begin to see transportation is also really critical uh, to make the jump from low to middle income. And again, now thinking about many of these developing economies, uh, what this uh, graph shows you is the proportion of the income that is associated with different industrial or, or different activities. Uh, so the purple are services, the blue is industry, but importantly, this dark sort of teal color here, this is associated with agriculture. So in many ways, the challenge is to increase access for agriculture, uh, increase energy access for agriculture. And at least when I think about electric or agriculture, I don't necessarily jump right away to thinking about energy, but you can see is that every step uh, along the way from primary production through um, irrigation, mechanis mechanization, agricultural input, fertilizers basically, um, then in post-harvesting, drying, and cold storage. Uh, our team here at Stanford has done a lot of work on, on drying and some work on cold storage as well. Moving into food processing, things like evaporation, distillation, canning, packing, uh, and so forth, you know, all the way through, you know, how do you get this to, to consumers? So, so this is a very concrete place we can start as we think about energy access and building up these productive energy uses is to try to couple to the existing um, production systems uh, and make them more robust by figuring out how do we develop, deliver clean energy to those. So just one final thought um, on, uh, on the global population. So we talked about today, if we could have equal energy access, we'd only need 20 more, 20% 20 more energy, which I found very encouraging. Um, but we have to look to the future. And of course, we know the population is growing. I'm sure you've all seen these. So these are provided by the United Nations. They update these every year. Uh, so this is uh, today's population, where are we? We are, what, 20, yeah, we're about here. Anyway, about 8.1 billion. The projection is that the uh, uh, global population by 2100 is going to increase anywhere from say nine to 11 billion people. Uh, interestingly, over the last, uh, decade in particular over the last five years, these estimates have progressively gone down and down and down every year, which again, I think is very, very uh, encouraging. But nevertheless, we will have more people. And uh, it's worth spending a moment to sort of look at where these population increases are going to happen. Uh, so these are the least developed countries uh, where we expect uh, the most growth. Largely, this is uh, going to, it's projected to happen in Africa, increasing from about uh, a billion people today uh, up to uh, perhaps as many as, as uh, three billion people. Uh, again, and this is going to be the most challenging because hopefully by now that you, 
I've uh, made the case that providing energy access to the least developed people is the most challenging because of the structural issues, but nevertheless needs to be done. Um, but very interesting, if we look at uh, lower middle income countries, what we see is that you know we're close to the peak. And certainly for upper middle income countries, uh, what we're expecting to see you know, within the next decade or so is uh, the gradual depopulation, which again is going to take pressure off the global energy system to uh, meet our demands. So, uh, so again, if we go back to the question of how much energy will we need by 2100, uh, 100 gigajoules per person times uh, 10.5 billion people, uh, about 1,050 exajoules or about 1 1.6 uh, times today's energy use. So we've got a lot of work to do, um, but, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's not quite as hard as it used to seem. And with that, just uh, finishing up, uh, again, just incredibly important to find a way to provide much more reliable, accessible energy to the, to the billions of people who lack access today. So thanks very much.